on the third floor of a nondescript building at the University of California, Los Angeles, resides a small room with a big secret. In this room is a man. Is it a video? Here's a question. How many revolutions do you know of where you can tell me the exact minute when the revolution began and the exact four square feet where it started? We can tell you exactly that these four square feet where this machine stands and when it sent the first message from itself to another computer 400 miles to the north, exactly when that happened and what it was. And in fact, the first message ever was sent from this machine on October 29th, 1969, at 10.30 at night. Now, do you know what that message was? Not too many people do. So what was the first message ever on the internet? Low, as in, lo and behold. We couldn't have planned a more powerful, more prophetic, more succinct message than low. The only thing we have to record that event is in a computer log. And the most important entry in this log is right here. It says on October 29th, 1969, at 10.30 at night, we talked to SRI, 400 miles to the north, host to host, computer to computer. This is the only record, the most important record, of that first message ever on the internet. And as I mentioned before, that message was low as in, lo and behold. One of the important things to understand about why the internet evolved the way it did was the culture of the people who helped build it and the people who helped to fund it. In 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik, the first Earth-orbiting satellite, and they caught the United States with our pants down. And then President Eisenhower decided that'll never happen again. The Russians were ahead of us now. And he decided to fund all the STEM technologies with great amounts of government funding to increase the capability that we had. And so he formed the Advanced Research Projects Agency to fund computer science, biology, chemistry, physics, etc. Now by 1966, they were already funding a number of computer science efforts around the country. Now it's important to note that the motivation was exactly that, to share computing resources. It was not, as the urban myth holds, to protect the United States against a nuclear attack by typically the Russians and provide a network that would survive such an attack. That is an urban myth. The reason was to share resources. Now, in those days, I and many of my colleagues, we knew everybody on the internet. It was called the ARPANET at the time. I knew every one of them, and they were trusted, and they behaved well. And this was a new experiment, something called networking. We wanted people to participate and join. And it wasn't that easy to get people to participate. They wanted to stay in their own little domains. So we made it very easy for them to join. And in particular, we didn't put any impediments in their way. As the ARPANET began to expand, other types of networks began to attach to the ARPANET. We had something called the Packet Radio Network, Aloha Net. We had a satellite network. And as that happened, it became clear we needed a more efficient protocol to allow these different networks to talk to each other through the ARPANET. So the long-range future of the internet, I believe, will be one where we have a pervasive global nervous system on this planet, where the internet is everywhere. It's always available, always accessible, easily accessible, and providing services and functionality to the individual. We have created a system for constantly surprising us. And how wonderful that is. 
it's an opportunity for young people to generate their ideas, their applications, their surprises for us in a continual basis.